Good evening, Kavina Valley. This is Dr. Elizabeth Emenheiser, Superintendent of Schools. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I can see that we're still um, allowing some participants to enter the Zoom meeting. Uh, as they do so, I just personally wanna first thank our Board of Education for their continued support of our district, our students, and our staff and community. I also wanna thank uh, my, our cabinet team who's joining me here this evening as well as our technology support services team and Ms. Maria Donez, our translator for those of you who are listening and participating in the Zoom meeting in Spanish. Um, we just wanted to take a few minutes uh, in light of everything that is um, going on as far as in the social media, as well as some of the picketing that you might be seeing to give you an update on the status of um, negotiations. So first, just um, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, but just to remind everyone, uh, Covina Valley does have uh, a preschool with about 280 students. There's two locations, the Covina Valley Children's Center on Roxburgh, as well as the one on Pioneer here on Barranca. We also have about 11,000 students enrolled in our TK through 12th grade programs with nine elementary schools, three middle schools, four high schools, and our online academy. We also offer a, an adult transition program um, for, for our adult students with uh, special needs as well as medically fragile adults, 18 to 22 year olds. Um, we have a robust uh, adult education program that is offered through Tri-Community Adult Education and they offer career technical education as well as community classes and um, academic classes. Our funding is one of our um, primary drivers as far as negotiations are concerned. And we have different funding sources. Uh, what we call our general fund or LCFF base is what we are able to use and spend most of our, our budget, most of our budget is composed of this. It is primarily comes from the state of California and it is spent over 80% on salaries and health and welfare. Um, additional things that we can spend it on our utilities and supplies. So we talk about this fund as our base or our unrestricted funds, um, which is why it can be um, spent on salaries and things like that. In addition to that, we do get a supplemental concentration grant funding. Uh, this funding is strictly for increasing and improving services for low income uh, students who are identified based on the National Free and Reduced Meals Program, foster youth, and, and English language learners. Um, so it is only for those students that it is um, designated for. There are funding categories, which we call restricted funding. An example of this would be like Title IV. It is for school safety, and we use these funds to help fund our school resource officers and some of our crossing cards. And then occasionally the state or the federal government will give us what we call one-time funds. And these are funds that we will get just um, for something. So we got a lot of COVID funding to help pay for personal protective equipment um, and different things like that. Um, but these are not ongoing funding. There are funding funds that we get, and once they are spent, they are gone. So when we talk about um, raises, it's kind of like when you are buying a car, um, you don't take a one-time fund to put a down payment on if you can't afford to make the monthly payments. And so um, it is uh, not advisable to use one-time funds for salary increases that are on or ongoing expenses. Our, our um, funding, uh, our base funding is highly volatile based on enrollment and what we call the state of California as well as um, attendance. And so if you are unaware, there are declining birth rates um, in California, in LA County and in Covina Valley. Um, the cost of living has also gone up in California. So we have seen multiple families moving out of state. Um, most recently this year, we had quite a few that moved to Texas and Tennessee. Um, and so this graph shows that um, our enrollment trend has been significantly declining over the past 10 years and is, continued, is projected to continue to decline. Um, Traywick Middle School, just to give you an example, is currently at 637. Um, 
that's a decline of 217 students in the last five years. Um, it was up over 1,000 at one point. Covina High has declined 120 students in the last five years. Their current enrollment is uh, 1,097, and Cypress Elementary has declined 142 students in the last five years. Um, so what does this mean? These are small schools. Um, the Board of Education uh, has been very clear. Um, in the past, prior administration and boards have voted to close schools that were small um, and condense and combine schools. My husband will tell you both his elementary and middle school here in Covina Valley were closed due to declining enrollment. Um, but the board has been very um, intentional that they do not want to close schools. And we do believe that small schools are good for children. So without the students in enrollment, um, it's hard to have them show up for attendance. And we are not funded on enrollment, we're actually funded on what we call attendance, average daily attendance. And so, um, and it is for a period of time, it cuts off um, basically right around um, the 130th day of school. And so if, for example, in this little example, if you have a student who is here every single day for those 130 days and you get $10,000 a year for every day, you're gonna get $10,000 for that student. Um, so you, all three of these students are enrolled, but the middle student is actually absent about 15% of the time. And so we only get $8,500 for that student. And then the third student, although they're there every day, they didn't enroll until the 31st day. So we would only get 7,700. So the decline in enrollment impacts us because obviously if we don't have the students, enrolled, they can't actually show up to school to be in attendance, and therefore um, the school district cannot get paid for those students. In addition to that, right prior to the um, to COVID happening, uh, the December 16th, 2019 first interim budget report, um, the district had what was called a qualified certification. Um, they had to send it to the district and what a qualified, there are three certifications for district school districts budget. One is positive, which is what we always want. Um, and basically it means that the district will be able to meet its financial obligation for the current year and the following two years. And qualified means that you may not be able to make your financial obligations, including payroll, for the current fiscal year and subsequent two fiscal years. And the negative is it's we will definitely not be able to make it. And so on December 16, 2019, Covina Valley had actually a qualified certification. This was after closing Lark Allen Elementary and making um, substantial cuts in programs and different things. So the Board of Education was forced with immediately cutting $7.25 million dollars by the end of the 21-22 school year. Um, and, and within that first year, by the what we call the second interim, which was conducted um, prior to closing down the schools, we had to adopt a fiscal stabilization plan. And that stabilization plan just for the 1920 school year, we had to show that we were cutting $3.7 million. And that is the adopted fiscal stabilization plan for that first year. Um, it was half of that 7.25 million that was sent to the county to actually get the district to a point where they could actually um, be, have a positive certification for the second interim. And so um, it was a fiscal crisis. Um, Unfortunately, COVID did happen. Um, one of the results of COVID though was that we did get um, some of our costs, um, such as electricity, things like that went down, um, but we still continued to pay our employees. Um, we still continued to have instruction, even though it was remote, and we can still, can still continue to feed our, our students and community. Um, but the state did give us a lot of one-time funding um, to do things like replace our 25-year-old air conditioners, to replace our, our water fountains with um, water bottle fillers, all sorts of different um, protective equipment um, was used, including roofing and repairing roofs. Um, but this is what um, the district was facing immediately prior to COVID. Um, and this is what, why the Board of Education subsequently adopted a, a, a goal for the district that we would have long-term fiscal stability. Um, and so what that means 
is that um, with the majority of our funding uh, being paid on um, salaries, we are a people business and it absolutely should be spent on salaries and health and welfare. Um, however, um, it can't be to a point where we become um, that fiscally at risk again in crisis. And so um, just to give you an idea of what our negotiation status is, we do have three bargaining units. Um, one of them is California School Employees Association with 507 members. And then the um, the other, the they have settled their negotiation. Um, they have 507 members. There's 650 employees, but some of them are part-time and have not joined. Um, Covina Valley Association of School Psychologists has 13, 15 employees and 13 members. They have also settled their negotiations. All have agreed for 21-22 with a hard cap in the equivalent of a 5.2% um, raise for last year. In the unrepresented employees, that actually includes our management, our um, confidential employees, um, and we have 316 employees in that um, unit um, or unrepresented. Sorry, no, it says X there. There's a typo there, but there are 616. Uh, 316 employees there, and they have also settled negotiation and um, for the 5.2% retroactive raise to 2021, July 1st, and um, the hard cap for new employees only. Um, our teachers union is known as the Covina Unified Educators Association. While there's 563 employees um, that are eligible for this association, there are 526 members of the union. Um, and that union has not, the union leadership has not reached a settlement agreement for the 21-22 school year. So what is that um, at, at the heart of this for what we call impasse, meaning we've reached a, an area where we're really struggling to get a settlement um, reached with the teachers union. Um, there's three primary issues for 21-22, and that is salary, health and welfare, and special education. And then uh, the, the union did um, ask for in September that we add on salary negotiations for 22-23. So CUEA, or the teachers union, is asking for a total of 15.2% raise, um, with that being 5.2% retro to July 1st of 2021 and a 10% raise for this year. Uh, our, as a district, uh, we have offered a 5.2% raise for 21-22, retroactive to July 1st of 21, um, similar to what our other units have agreed and settled on. And then the Board of Education during last night's meeting also approved the offer of an additional 5.3% for this school year, which would bring it to a total of 10.5% raise. And what's the impact of that? So when we look at our teacher salary schedule, they are on a, what we call a step and column and the highest paid teacher salary um, right now, if we put just the 5% uh, raise on it, it would bring it 5.2% raise on it. It would bring it to 114,853 a year. Um, with the 10.5% raise, it actually will make them at $120,940 annually, which is the highest teacher salary in the area. As you can see from the chart on the screen, um, it, it's 120,940. And that's just salary. It doesn't include uh, what we call health and welfare, which we also contribute at the highest level than any of our surrounding districts as well. Um, our average teacher, we are very fortunate that we do retain our teachers here in Covina Valley for quite a while. And so we have a, a, a very tenured st teaching staff and uh, the average teacher salary today without any additional hourly stipends, coaching or um, extra what we call one-fifth assignments. The average teacher salary is $93,356. And that, with that 10.5% raise, will increase it to approximately $103,416. So as you can see, um, this will make us, or continue to make us, one of the highest paid um, districts in the area and in the state. So health and welfare, um, the Covina Unified Educators Association is asking for no change at all for any employees. Um, and CVUSD um, 
with a goal of long-term fiscal stability in mind, um, has offered no change, absolutely no change for employees hired prior to July 1st of this year. And what that means is they get free dental, dental, Delta Dental and free VSP vision for their entire family. Uh, they get their choice of a family HMO coverage for it ranges between $35 and $70 a month for 10 months. So $350 to $700 per year for the cost to the employee for their entire family to have medical coverage. Um, and um, uncapped cost to the district. So basically the district's cost can continue to go up for the family coverage. Any increases to those premiums would be covered by the district. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what that is, the highest family cost in 21-22 was $25,865 for an HMO medical family plan. And if we added the HMO medical family plan, vision and dental, the cost to the district was $27,643. So that means that the district is, has to pay for an employee who chooses this $27,643 last year compared to a district like DeWarty, which is paying $7,500 or another district that has a hard cap of $12,000. So we're ranging anywhere between uh, $5,600 and $21,000 more per employee than our neighboring districts, um, which means that we have to take those costs and make sure that they are not um, used elsewhere. So what? Um, so although we've agreed on that, what the district is asking is that for new employees, so brand new employees, those are employees that um, have started with us um, this year, that they continue always to get their free choice of an HMO medical plan. They continue to get free dental and vision coverage for their family. And that the district offers a, a maximum contribution of $26,998 for their family medical premiums. Um, again, this is significantly higher than summer of our neighboring districts, as you can see on the screen. Um, Jordy was at 7,500, West Covina is at 17,000, Bonita is at 12,000. Um, so when you hear about districts like Bonita giving a 10% raise, even though um, they're only paying 12,000 maximum, where Covina Valley is paying another um, about 15,000 more than um, Bonita Unified in healthcare coverage for our family coverage. Um, and so what we're saying is this is like, make this the maximum. And so anything above that, then the teacher would be picking up the additional cost for their family. Um, it still would continue to be one of the highest amounts paid by school districts not only in the area, but actually in the state of California. And it is more than double the state average, the, um, or approximately double the state average. The state average right now is 14,958. So again, it is about 17,000 or 12,000 more than the state average um, that Covina Valley is paying. On top of being one of the highest paid in salaries, we are also the highest pay, highest. Um, making the highest contribution to those family medical plans, which long-term fiscally um, is, is not a prudent. And so the, the third issue at stake is the special ed case management. CVUSD is one of the only districts in the state of California where special ed teachers are not the case manager and shifting case management to teachers allow for smaller caseloads with more individual focus on each student by the person who really knows them their best, their classroom teacher. Um, for this, the district is offering additional compensation, preparation time, uh, training and support uh, in, in the form of clerical support to special education teachers for case management. And we are also, um, uh, saying this change wouldn't uh, impact until July 1st of 2024 so that we can make sure that our teachers are fully trained and comfortable um, with this transition. So the question out there um, that we are hearing is what would happen if a teacher strike? 
First and foremost, the district has requested that CUEA leadership give the district a five-day notice um, prior to striking. Um, we do know that they have voted and given and have authorization for that. So we have made, we are in the process and have plans ready should they decide to strike. Um, we, once we get that notice from CUEA leadership, we will be notifying parents and guardians. And our schools, I do want to assure you, will remain open and our instruction will continue um, at all of our school sites. And at this point, we would like to take some questions. I do have Dr. Andrea Katanik, who is um, going to read any of those questions that we get. We have Mr. Manny Correa, who is our Chief Business Officer here, as well as Ms. Christine Tatt, for our Director of Fiscal Services, that will be answering any financial questions. Dr. Michelle Dahl, our Assistant Superintendent of uh, Personnel, will be answering any of our personnel questions. And Ms. Dr. Jonathan Blackmore will be answering any of the educational uh, related questions. So Dr. Katanik, do we have any questions? There are no questions at this time. Okay. I think we just put the link up. So how about if we just wait just a few minutes there, give people a time to type. Do you want to, uh, if you do have questions, we do keep updates on our webpage uh, under negotiations. Uh, or you can find that tab on, on the front page, but also under the personnel tab. We do have a question. Our first question is, how will instruction continue with no teachers? So I'll answer that question. So um, we work with our educational services team, our site administrators, um, and our other staff to provide instructional activities and make sure all of our certificated staff, as well as highly qualified substitute teachers, are on the school sites and are in the classrooms providing instruction daily for the students. Will the will the instruction be of the same quality of education they are getting now from their teachers? The instruction will look different, um, and it will be dependent upon students that are at school and, and the staff at the school, but it will be highly engaging um, instruction that will that will be grade level appropriate and, and um, like I said, engaging and um, appropriate for the students and relevant to what they're doing at the school currently. Will you commit to publishing the fact finding report on Parent Square? We will be publishing the fact finding report. We are required to publish the fact finding report uh, within 10 days of receiving it. Will children continue to receive speech services? Yeah, so uh, services will continue for um, students that have specialized services at the school. And in the event that there are none, there will absolutely be compensatory services. Are the people who would be taking the place of teachers credentialed to be in the classroom? Is this legal and a Williams compliance issue? Yes, the people that would be in the classrooms are credentialed and this would not be a Williams compliance issue. Will custodians and office staff be delivering instruction? No, no. they will not. How can you ensure there will be subs with a strike if there's a shortage of subs now? Dr. Dahl. Hello. So we, um, excuse me, we have contracted out with three different agencies that will also bring us um, subs. And we also are going to be uh, reflying all of our substitute positions. We currently have over 200 and we are raising our daily rate from $210 a day to $600 a day for all subs who come out and substitute during a strike. When exactly will the results of fact finding be published? So the fact finding report, uh, we are anticipating receiving uh, any day now, most likely it will be early next week. 
who will instruct the students if the teachers go on strike? We will use um, substitutes. We also have administrators who have credentials. And once again, we will be hiring our substitutes at a daily rate of $600. What is happening to the current case managers? The, the current case managers are school psychologists and they would remain um, in the district and they would provide more of the, the services that they've been trained for and that are essential for our, for our, for our students and more within uh, their, their role and their, their job duties. There has been talk that the janitors and groundskeepers are being offered stipends to be in the classroom. That is false information. Why did the district office initiate fact finding instead of continuing negotiations? Fact finding is a continuation of negotiations. Um, when two parties have been trying for um, quite a while to actually uh, settle an agreement and they are um, at a loss and um, are not coming to an agreement, um, the Public Employee Relations Board does allow for you to declare an impasse and to ask for help. So basically, it's in. Um, we had an independent mediator, and the fact finding panel is three. Um, one person selected by the district, one selected by the teachers union, and one um, neutral person who really truly look at the the different facts from each side and try and also negotiate a settlement. Well, the hard cap is the highest in the area today. How would you guarantee that moving forward? A hard cap is always um, something that is negotiable. Every year when we negotiate with all of our unions, health, welfare, and salary are open for negotiations. What was not working about the current psych case carrier model? Our current psychologists right now, they are the case carriers and their caseloads range between anywhere from 60 to 140 students. Also teachers through their educational training through the universities are trained to be case carriers. Um, and that is the normal role of a special education teacher throughout the state of California. How will you rebuild trust and rapport with teachers and the community? We're gonna to continue to work with our teachers and our parents and our students and continue to provide high quality education and services and focus on the needs of all of our students, community and teachers. Can the current LCFF funding meet CUEA requests? The, the current funding uh, that's being offered for 22-23 uh, can meet the immediate needs of, of the request from CUA, but long term, the district is concerned about physical stability as we were in 1920 when we were deficit spending uh, over $8 million per year. Do you foresee combining classrooms in the event you do not have enough staff to instruct? Yes, that could um, occur during a strike. And that's where we would be working with our site administrators and the subs that we hire to ensure that if we do have to combine any classes, that it's at the appropriate grade level, as well as curriculum and coursework. As a parent, I'm concerned that your current plans to cap benefits will limit our about ability to attract top talent. What is the plan con to continue to attract top talent as the salary schedules you mentioned are inaccurate and old? Neighboring districts pay their teachers more. Currently, we are one of the highest paying districts in the area. And we also are the highest um, district in the area for health and welfare. So currently that has not been an issue for attracting um, and retaining our teachers and our staff. Dr. Dahl, what, how many new teachers did we have this year? Over 57 new hires this year. Um, did the majority of them take family coverage or individual? Individual. So the family coverage wouldn't be something that was attracting 
No, really when people come to our district, the first question that is asked, how much money am I going to make? And when they see where we line up with our neighboring districts, that's not an issue. Have you done a financial analysis of the impact of a strike that a strike would have instead of giving an annual increase and leave benefits where they are now instead of creating um, disruption to the district? We, we have done that, that uh, analysis. Uh, and again, short term, uh, it would be impactful if there was a strike. Uh, but again, the car cap uh, long term would be in the best interest of the district's finances to avoid uh, necessary reductions in staffing and or having to close schools in the future. If a student is absent during the teacher's strike, will, will their absence be considered unexcused? Yes, the, there are no changes to the regular attendance policies. During a strike, students that do not attend school would be marked absent. And if those absences weren't clear, they would be unexcused. Will the students have as much instruction in a day as they do now, or will they only have it for a portion of the day? Uh, our elementary school days, our, our plan at this time is for our elementary schools to have a, uh, the same beginning and start time for their school day. We are looking at options for our secondary schools, and one of those options does uh, include possibly shortening the school day. So not, by, not by much, though. There are several questions um, regarding the teacher side of negotiations. Could we share the teacher side, or how would they get information about the teacher side of negotiations? We have posted a, um, a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison on our website. There are several comments and concerns regarding paying substitutes $600 a day uh, versus using that money for teacher raises or other district expenses. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Again? There are several comments and concerns regarding paying substitutes $600 a day as opposed to using that for teacher raises or other things within the district. So, so the number that uh, we would be paying our substitute teachers would be in line with what our average teacher makes on a daily basis. Uh, so yes. we, we would uh, try to be competitive to ensure that we have enough support uh, in the classroom. There are also some concerns about the accuracy of the information being put out um, by the district on the website. So maybe if you could explain where that information comes from. Uh, all that information obtained for the comparable districts have uh, come came from the um, in the state and, and the county office of education. Every district uh, is required to submit information to the state of California and the county office of education. And so the information that we're using for comparables is coming from uh, those sources. The substitute teachers my students have had this year have not provided any instruction. Will the substitute teachers be responsible for developing lesson plans? How will the district ensure that there is in fact instruction should the teachers go on strike? Um, we are working with ed services to create curriculum and lessons for our students. Um, I'm sorry to hear that some of the substitutes haven't had lessons because it is required that current teachers who do take a sick day or personal do lead lesson plans. Let me just catch up here. How does adding case carrier duties allow for smaller caseloads? Okay, so Currently, uh, the case managers are the psychologists, and we we have, what is it, uh, Michelle, 17? We have 14.5 psychologists for all of our students in the district, and currently, as case carriers, they range between um, seeing 60 to 140 students as a case load. So, so in that, so if the case management responsibilities uh, transfer to the teacher, the, the case Loads would range anywhere from be, from between eight students per teacher up to the uh, legally allowed maximum, which would be 28 students for um, SAI, less than 50% special education students. If teachers go on strike, will subs use online curriculum that the teachers have already established, i.e. Google Classroom? 
Um, our, the educational service team and the instructional team is looking at a variety of different activities and um, for students. Some of the materials may be using um, online resources and curriculum, but a, a, a large portion of the activities will be hands-on um, activities that take place on the campuses during the school day. Will there be a maximum class size across K-12 grade levels during the strike? We have the same class sizes. Although it might be the class sizes may will maybe um, larger during a strike, yeah. but they will definitely be same class. Yeah, sizes. so sorry. So the, the, the class sizes really would depend upon the number of students at the school. Um, at that given day in, in the school administrators and the staff on campus would look to to group and organize the um, the students into to safe and appropriate um, classes and then they would conduct their instructional activities accordingly. I've read that California is providing long term 13% funding increase to K-12 schools. Is this long term funding increase not enough to cover CUEA's request? Uh, the, the actual number is 12.84% uh, COLA for the 22-23 year. Uh, the, the current request by CUA, which covers 15.2 and uncapped health benefits, uh, would uh, create a deficit structural or structural deficit spending for the district. This means that the district would be spending more money than it's actually receiving from the state uh, due to a lot of factors, including the enrollment decline that Dr. Ermenheiser had mentioned previously in her presentation. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the big concern is the long-term physical stability of the district uh, and implementing a hard cap uh, for new employees only uh, would ensure the district would not be in a position where it would have to reduce staffing and, and again or close uh, schools in the future. Could the strike go on for days? Uh, we hope not, but yes, it could. Can you show data with the step salary schedules with neighboring districts instead of showing average salaries to show a true salary comparison? Um, yes, we could. How, however, most of our teachers, we have a very veteran teaching staff. We have um, out of all of our current teachers right now, 71% um, are at the very last column, which is the highest teaching um, salary that we showed. And also their 25% are also in the last column and step. So for us to show the average and as well as the highest average teacher is, is kind of what all of our teachers are are paid at. Um, so it's it's easier than just showing all of the various steps and columns. And um, Mr. Korea, um, the numbers that we use, don't we use the what we call the J90, where each school district is required to file um, and they have to include their average teacher salary. So um, while Covina Valley has a very tenured staff, our average teacher salary is about 93,000 something, where another district's average salary might be um, very new and on the lower end of the salary schedule. So versus looking at that, it's, it's isn't it more fiscally prudent to look at average? Yes, it is. And, and, and there's a lot of factors that go into, uh, to, into that. One of them being that more teachers you have in the last column or the last step, uh, the higher your average is gonna be. So another district, uh, that has a younger um, uh, population of teachers may have a much smaller average um, um, amount for a teacher, which would cost the district significantly less. The other component to look at uh, when you're looking at comparables is that there's other districts that um, their last, their highest paid salary is not until step 35. Uh, and that's the case with some of our, our neighboring districts that they have uh, step 35 or step 30 for their highest paid or at Covina Valley Unified. Um, it's a step 25, which essentially means that after 25 years, you're at the last step in the last um, last step of, in highest peak uh, part of the salary shift. And how then would we also compare with total compensation? The other major component is that when you're looking at comparables, uh, you're looking at total compensation, which means you're not only looking at the salary component, but you're also looking at the contribution the district is making on behalf of the employee for health uh, and welfare. Again, that would include uh, dental vision, uh, um, medical, dental, vision, and life insurance. And, and again, Vina Valley Unified School District 
is at the very top in the LA County uh, for medical contributions and overall health and welfare contributions. So when you're looking at it, it's the component of salary plus that $27,000 that the district is contributing for health and welfare, where um, we really stand at the top uh, of all districts in the county. Um, and even with this cap, will we remain at the top? We will, uh, because again, the cap that we're uh, proposing is significantly higher than hard caps, um, other districts that have hard caps in place. So to give an example, example, uh, a neighboring district um, uh, has a hard cap of $17,000 that would do uh, medical dental vision alive, and the district is only proposing uh, a hard cap of a little bit under $27,000 for medical only. The district would still continue to pay 100% of the cost for dental vision and life insurance. And with this cap, would an employee still be able to afford a family coverage? Yeah, and so that's another excellent point that um, needs to be discussed. Mm -hmm. So with the current cap that we're offering at $26,998 for just medical, um, an employee can still continue to take blue shield access uh, and not pay anything for this year or in the coming years. Uh, for instance, we're using Kaiser. Kaiser is only $22,113. Um, so for the foreseeable future, uh, we're, we're anticipating that for the next eight to 10 years, the hard cap will not impact any employees and then still have an HMO coverage um, that they will be able to take for, for the next eight to 10 years. For their family. For their family, thank you. <clears throat> Um, how much additional planning time are you proposing special educa education teachers get for the additional work of being case managers? At our secondary level, currently we're on a seven period day and all of our teachers teach five classes. And so for our special education teachers at the secondary level, they would teach four classes, have one period for all of their case manager planning and, um, and work that they needed to do, as well of, as have the two additional periods for conference and PLC. So instead of teaching five, they would teach four. So they would get an additional period off in the daytime for all of the case management planning and organization. At the elementary level, we were proposing giving um, each teacher I'm looking at 75. 75 minutes a week um, that they could take at one time each week for their planning and coordination, as well as access to clerical support um, and an additional stipend. And I believe it looks like we have um, duplicates of some of the questions that have been already answered. Um, so perhaps what we could do is uh, um, combine them and kind of create a frequently asked questions that we can post within the next few days on the internet. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending our town hall. Again, please um, keep in touch by following us on social media and checking out our website. Um, if you have further questions about negotiations, um, our negotiations webpage does. Um, post up we post updates there regularly you're also um, welcome to um, call or set up a meeting individually with one of us if you have individual concerns thank you and have, have a wonderful evening <laughs>